Good stuff. I pray that that's uh, why we're here today, amen? amen? I'd like to read from Isaiah chapter number 9, verses <clears throat> 2 and 6. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we are so grateful to you this morning, Lord, because we have seen a great light, Lord, and we did walk in darkness. Truly, you have been the light that is, as often in your word says, it has pulled us from the clay, the miry clay, from the fiery pit. Lord, we're just so thankful that you came here to be born as just a, a little baby, but the story didn't end there, that you stayed and you died for us on that horrible cross, Lord. So thankful for that. Just pray today that as we, we celebrate your birth, Lord, that we would do so, Father, believing it, Lord, so many in this world now, so many even Christians tend not to believe that you came and were born of a virgin. Father, I pray that we would believe it, that we'd teach it to our children. And Lord, that every day we'd be so grateful and thankful for the thing, things that you have done for us. We truly are blessed far more than we deserve. Look forward to what you're going to do th today, Lord. What a glorious day to get saved on Christmas Day. Pray that if someone here doesn't know you, that they might get that right today. We love and praise you. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> I did want to uh, uh, remind everybody about the, the, the New Year's Eve party. That's going to be next Saturday, which will be December 31st. It'll start at 8 o'clock. All kinds of stuff to eat back there. The, the tables will just be covered with things. Um, it's always a lot of fun. There's going to be, uh, of course, food, but there's going to be a lot of fun, fellowship, singing, uh, there'll be uh, uh, several testimonies that night, and there will even be games and door prizes. And so uh, if you don't already have something going on with your family, it's a great place to come and be a part of. Uh, bring a snack with you when you come, and uh, that way there's plenty for everybody. So uh, put that on your calendar. That'll be on Christmas Eve next, next uh, Saturday night. That's what I said. Yeah. New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. Yeah. All right. Maybe next year I'll get better at this job. I've only been doing it for about 20 years. So. <laughs> we can't find anybody to take it. All right. We always do like to welcome our first-time visitors here with us. And uh, if this is your first time here to worship with us, we're not going to embarrass you in any way. But if you just hold your hand up for just a moment where we can see you, we have something we like to give our first-timers. Good to have you with us this morning, sir. And if you would, please just uh, take that... Uh, that card and fill it out and then on your way out this morning if you just put it in one of those bowls there in the back we'd be very grateful thank you all right turn in your hymnals to hymn number 86 hymn number 86 O little town of bethlehem
silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessings of his hand. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. All right, our last hymn this morning will be number 100. Hymn number 100, go ahead and stand. We'll sing Angels We Have Heard on High. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Strains prolong what the glad sun tidings be, which inspire your heavenly song. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Sing, come adore unbended knee, Christ the Lord, the newborn King. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Joseph, lend your aid while our hearts in love we raise. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Our youth choir is going to make their way up here. Those that know Jesus, what a wonderful name. Our youth choir sang last Sunday night. If you weren't here, you really missed a great Christmas music program. One of the songs they did, Jesus, what a wonderful name. It was a new song. And I had more than one older person ask me, 
and I won't mention any names because I don't want to embarrass Miss Lori's husband, but they can't hear as good as they should. And they said, we'd sure like to, to, to see what they were singing because they can't, can't always pick out the words. And so, Jesus, What a Wonderful Name is a song we did, and the kids are going to sing that. And by the time we get to the chorus, if you feel like singing along, you'll be able to see what the lyrics are above our head. But uh, Jesus is truly the name above all names, and I hope you make much of Jesus this year. And so uh, we will sing, Jesus, What a Wonderful Name. Jesus, and I love the fact that He came and died for us, and you know, for a long time, uh, really, truth is, uh, all of us have to come to a place where we trust Christ, so you know, there's always a time in everybody's life when they really don't have any realization of the impact of the incarnation, that God that made us. And by the way, if you're here and you're not sure about that, you're not an accident. Amen. You're not some 
uh, cosmic accident that gradually became an animal and kept getting better. You're not an animal. You're not an accident. You're a special creation of God. And we're separated from God by sin. But what we're actually celebrating right now is the way that God bridged the gap so that we could get back in fellowship with Him. And that, was, that culminated at the cross and the tomb and the resurrection. But it started uh, back in the incarnation when Christ, the Bible says, unto us... Uh, a son is born unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given. The Son of God was given to man. And so I'm so grateful for that. And if you came expecting to hear Christmas passage preached on Christmas, well, good news, that's what we're going to do, amen? So if you got your Bible, take it out and turn to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, the author, was a tax collector. He was a guy that none of his neighbors liked. He was a traitor to Rome. And especially Jews that looked for a Messiah that would deliver them, they would have had a very low opinion of a Roman sellout, a traitor Jew who gathered taxes for the Roman government. But that's who Matthew was. In case you're not familiar, Matthew, Levi, the evangelist, he had a time when Jesus called him by name and changed his life. And we get to read his account, his inspired account, of the birth of Christ. So turn to Matthew chapter 1. Stand with me. We're going to start with verse 18 and then we will read through chapter 2 verse 12. But if you would follow along with me, I would appreciate that. We want to look at what we're shown in the in the Christmas what we refer to as the Christmas passage and in case you haven't been here, I know I don't dogmatically assert that Jesus Christ was born December 25th. And yes, I do understand there were pagan celebrations and all that kind of thing. But can I tell you this? I'm not exactly sure when Christ was born of a virgin, but I celebrate the fact that He was born of a virgin. And this is what we're going to read uh, this morning. And so follow along with me. And to, to this morning's encouragement is that the uh, application would be that we would be like the wise men. I want to be wise, amen, in our relationship to Christ. And so that's what we'll see. But it starts out in verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when, as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying... Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, and by the way, if you go to Luke's gospel, you'll find out the details of how that came about. But let's jump straight into this account of the wise men coming. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art thou not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then, 
excuse me, then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Do y'all know that sometimes political authorities lie? Just an observation there on the passage. But when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped nine. Verse nine. When they heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. We want to look at the wise men this morning. I want to ask you, are you a wise man this morning? As we celebrate the birth of Christ in this sense, I hope that this is something we can apply this morning. Lord, we love you and praise you. God, I'm grateful for my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here this morning. Lord, we come together and Lord, it is a day that we want to give you glory and honor as we celebrate Christmas. Lord, I pray that Christ, our Messiah, you would be the forefront of our mind, that we would truly come and adore and worship you. Lord, I'm grateful for this passage. Lord, you put this story in here for our good so that we would know uh, what it is you want us to know. And I pray that our eyes would be open to your word and your word would be opened unto us. God, I pray that we would be edified and encouraged this morning, challenged, convicted if necessary. And Lord, I pray that each one of us as your children would be better equipped for the work of the ministry you've given us. God, I pray if someone here this morning is lost, they've never been saved, they've never trusted your atoning work on the cross, your resurrection, if they've never called on your name in faith, I pray this morning would be the morning of salvation. And Lord, above all, we ask you to be exalted, glorified, and lifted up. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I just love this passage. And, and in case you're unfamiliar, some of you are new to the Christian faith. I know we have new believers in the building, and I'm grateful for that. But not every gospel, we have the four gospels. Not every gospel gives details about Jesus' lineage or his birth. Matthew and Luke have what we refer to as nativity stories, stories of Jesus being born. And many of us have seen nativity scenes where sometimes they'll have a living nativity. And yesterday we went to my, uh, my, my grandma hosted our family reunion at the Creek Nation Community Center. And I think just because we got Creek cards, we get to do it there for free. But I'm not sure on that. We might be paying. I don't know. I'm not paying for it. But I was blessed as we went into the Creek Nation Community Center to see... Um, a nativity scene. I mean, there was there was not, nothing there. I think they'd been doing a living nativity because there was just, you know, a manger and a star above it. But it was clear what was represented was uh, a biblical reference to the birth of Christ. And that, that was a blessing to me. I, I don't believe it's inappropriate to celebrate Jesus any day and especially not today. Uh, it's a perfectly fine and appropriate to do that. And so... As we look at this story, and, and like I say, Mark starts about Jesus' ministry and baptism, but Luke goes back to Bethlehem, and Matthew also gives us details about Jesus and uh, the, around the details concerning His birth. John's gospel goes all the way back to eternity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he says the Word was made flesh. That's his version of the nativity. But as we look at Matthew's account here, I think it's interesting, and we'll jump straight to our text, which will be chapter 2 primarily. I want to talk about these wise men. It's not controversy, but there's always been discussion when people have nativity scenes about whether or not the kings should show up at the manger. Because the Bible doesn't say they showed up at a manger. It actually says they showed up at a house. And it's clear to me that Joseph and Mary were in no hurry after this Difficult trip to Bethlehem. I think Joseph stayed there for a couple of reasons. First of all, to give Mary and Jesus some recovery time. But also, I believe that probably in his mind he thought, you know, it might be better to just hang out here, to stay here. It was the city of 
his family in an extended sense. He, that was his family's town. He was of the lineage of David and Bethlehem was where that family lineage originated. And so I think that he probably had some contacts and they got him a place to stay. And that's where the wise men showed up. We're not given specifics about that and I don't really think it makes that big of a deal. The wise men, is it's never said in the Bible that there was three of them. We, I think, traditionally base that off of the gifts. I'm simply giving a little background of who these guys were. They're referred to as wise men. Magi is what some people will translate that as. And, and if you ask where they came from, it says they came from the east. Now, most people are quick to point out that if you go east, if you go over to Persia, for example, the Persian Gulf is east of Israel. And during the time of Daniel, the Babylonians and the Medo, Mede and Persian Empire, there was a gospel witness through people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that country. And the fact that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were also of an order of wise men, even under a pagan king, there's... Many that believe that this was some fruit from Daniel's work, his ministry. We have a little bit of what Daniel did, but Daniel lived a long time. We're not given all the details of everything Daniel did. Daniel may have groomed his young men that he had led to a true knowledge of God to this fact that there's a Messiah coming. It's very possible. I'll just plant a little seed, something that I think is interesting. I kind of think Genesis 25 gives us the first reference of where these fellows might have originated. The Bible says that after Sarah died, Abraham remarried. Matter of fact, trivia that you may not pass unless you've heard this explained. Did you know that Isaac was not Abraham's only baby? After Sarah died, he married a woman named Keturah and he had sons, the Bible said, after Isaac and in that account, and I'll quickly read this because it's interesting to me, and if it's not interesting to you, I'm sorry, but you just have to bear with me, amen? But in Genesis chapter 25, the Bible says, Then again Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah, and she bare him Zimram, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. And Jokshan begat Sheba, and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim, and Latushim, and Leumim. These were some odd names, don't know why they named them that, but uh, probably a little more popular back in that day. But listen to what it says, And the sons of Midian, Ephah, and Epher, and Hanok, and Abida, and Elda, these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubine which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts, and sent them away from Isaac his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. Now I read that because, do you know the Bible says that Abraham gave these men... These would be men. The Bible says Abraham was a father of many nations, and this is a list of some of them. So that means that Abraham, it says he gave them gifts and sent them east. And a little history on Abraham. Do you know that the reason God chose, one reason the Bible says that he would show and reveal himself to Abraham is because he said, I know Abraham, he will teach his children after him. I personally think that all the way back in Genesis, we get a hint of something. He gave them gifts. I can't think of a greater gift than this knowledge that one day, I believe Abraham said, listen boys, I'm sending you away because Isaac is my heir. But boys, I'm going to give you a gift and I'm going to tell you something. Through Isaac, all the nations of the world will be blessed one day. Because God said that through and maybe he even told them the story. Hey, listen, Isaac was going to be a dead boy. He, his mother was a hundred. And I, besides that, I was going to have to kill him, is what I was told. And yet, his life was spared and God provided a ram. I'm just saying, is it possible that he said, God will provide himself a lamb to these boys too? I don't know, but maybe. Is it possible that the seeds for this wise man visit that we celebrate were planted all the way back in Genesis? Yes. I think so. I th my opinion. This is extra biblical. I pray it's not unbiblical. But I believe these wise men, they were the guardians of the gifts that Abraham had given. Amen. Now, I also think that's kind of confirmed because one of these boys' descendants was the queen of Sheba. And do you know what? She came to Solomon and brought him gold and incense and stuff like that. Isn't that odd? 
descendants of this same line. And, and you'll find that both in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles, that, that she showed up. And do you know that the Bible says when she saw Solomon, not just the questions he answered, but when she saw his procession and his worship of the one true God in that temple, said almost all the breath went out of her. I'm paraphrasing, but she said half, the half had not been told. I, I believe she came to know the one true God. This is my opinion. But I believe that he also, Solomon's wisdom told him, hey, there's a wiser than me going to be born. I believe that. Now, these fellas, whether it was influence from Genesis or Solomon, Abraham or Solomon or Daniel, it doesn't clearly say, but it does say this. They knew a whole lot more than most Gentile kings would have known. Now, some would say there's not any reference in the Word of God that they were kings. Why do we call them kings? We three kings. And, and I don't think that's necessarily unbiblical because in Isaiah 60, there's a prophecy. And in Isaiah 60, verse 3, it says, And Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Verse 6 of chapter 60 of Isaiah says, The multitude of camels shall cover thee, and dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord." Maybe it's not a direct fulfillment of Isaiah 66, but it could be. Or at least a shadowing of that. But it says this, let's go back to our text, Matthew 2. We understand a little bit of who they were. What the text says is they were wise men from the east. So I'm assuming that's all we actually need to know. They were wise men from the east and they came. So we know who they were. Let's talk about what they did. They came from the east. Now this should not be considered a flippant thing. Travel back then required cost, it was a risk, and it was a sacrifice. To travel, I mean, listen, we jump in cars and start them like it's nothing. Have you ever thought about the way it was for the bulk of human history when you did not have the luxury of modern travel? Do you know why? Do you know this wasn't a church originally? Lindsay Chapel didn't start out as a church, it started out as a school. Lindsay Chapel was a school. There was a school right over there at Sandy Bass Bay where the road split up. Some of y'all drive past that old rock building. That was a school. There was a school over here at Central High. And there was a school that Bain Wisenhunt went to called Ignorant Ridge. <laughs> That's his own testimony. It's what he told me. Do you know why there was schools had to be set down every few miles? Because people couldn't travel. They came from the east and they traveled. And I don't know whether it was camels or on foot or on horses. If, if they were really wise, they'd have been riding a quarter horse, amen. But anyhow, they got there and it was a long journey. It was a journey that required sacrifice. That's what they did. They traveled. And when they traveled, the Bible says, they came to, from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? So not only did they travel and risk and sacrifice, but this was a, a voyage, it was a trip with a purpose, and they were more than willing to let people know what they were doing. It says that they showed up saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and come to worship him. And you know, I just think sometimes that the majority of the body of Christ at least those that confess to know Christ, believe that they've been enlisted in the secret service. We don't really want people to know what we're about. Do you know if you're saved, you're about Jesus? Amen. If you're saved, your life should be about Jesus. And many times we, we seem unwilling to open our mouth and confess or profess Christ. Yet these Gentile kings, assuming... Uh, there's no reason to believe. It, it's very clear they came from a far country. This, this group of men, they were not ashamed to express their relationship to the new king. They were unashamed. In Romans 1.16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. But the truth is, many people are. Do you do what you do and do you go where you go? And Listen, are you willing to open your mouth and confess Christ? Do people know you have a king? Or are you kind of like an ambassador incognito? You don't want anybody to know. Well, I'm a heavenly citizen. This world's not my home, but don't tell anybody about it. 
Right? Can I tell you something? In the last few years, I've had a real good opportunity to witness to strangers like at the grocery store if I, have, if I get sent on a mission. Uh, and I'm not a very good shopper. If Lauren sends me to get something, it don't matter what the coupon she thinks she's taking advantage of, it always costs her more than if she'd have just got it herself. Because you put me through the food row. If I see some, when you're hungry and you go shopping, it ain't good, amen? I show up with all kinds of stuff she didn't tell me to get, amen? And I get there and the lady there, a lot of times it's not uncommon. People say, hi, how are you? Greet somebody, you're friendly and they greet you back. How are you doing? Do you know, I've gone out of my way to try to, to confess Jesus. I, I'd really, I've, I've tried to be intentional about this. And do you know when COVID was happening and... Let's just be real honest. We have been in a state of political turmoil for a while and people will maybe bring up problems or politics or something like that. Do you know what I'm quick to point out? I try to say, you know what? My hope is not in Washington, D.C. My hope is in heaven. Doesn't matter who the president is. I serve a king that's not going to get impeached and he's never going to get overthrown. Amen? There will be no su successful coups against my king. Amen? Amen? Right. And you know, it's really not that hard to do. And can I tell you this? When you, when you say something like that to somebody who knows Christ, boom, there's like a connection instantly. I, am I right? But man, when you say it to somebody who doesn't know Christ, sometimes I see people giving it some thought. You may say, oh, I'm not going to go out and witness. Well, wise men did. Listen, they were willing to talk about a king that they had yet to see. There's no way they could have known as much details as these Jews in Jerusalem. By the way, that's why they went there. And, and this is interesting. People debate about the planetary alignment during that time. And can I just say this? I have no reason to believe this was some natural phenomena. This seems to be a variable, task-specific star. But can I just say this? The God that hung the stars in place where they are has no problem creating a special Christmas spotlight star. And I know it was probably not on Christmas, but just bear with me. What I'm saying is that star they followed, it first got them in the general location and it got them to Jerusalem. But this is the interesting thing. God turned it off for a little bit, apparently. Why would He do that? Have you ever thought about the story? God could have taken them directly there, right off the bat. But he brought them to Jerusalem. And this is impressive, because Herod and all Jerusalem, they were troubled. Do you know why most of us won't talk about Jesus? Because in good old America, Oklahoma, Bible Belt, USA, there's still people that it troubles. Let's be real honest. Talking about the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ is not easy. It's easier to talk about hemorrhoid surgery than the gospel sometimes. <laughs> I'm telling you, some people, it's just, it's an awkward conversation when you bring up Jesus to somebody who doesn't know Him. Why? Because it troubles them. Herod and Jerusalem, they were troubled. Why? Because if this story is true, it's changing things. We cannot stick with the status quo if what this story is about is true. It's got big implications. And that's troubling. Especially when you've got everything rolling along about how you like to roll along and you're throwing a wrench in the gears by telling me there's a new king born, a king of the Jews born, and you've come to worship him. Herod was troubled for an obvious reason. And he responded with, with anger. He responded with deceit. But when he found out he was mocked of the wise men and they went a different way, listen, he had animosity and anger and he had a hateful response to the newborn king. He wanted to kill him. In Time Magazine, probably 20 years ago, some people that had voted on Person of the Year, and Jesus was right up there. Some popular film had come out, and He was right up there. And so there was some secular discussion about Jesus. And there was people saying, well, who would He be if He had come like now? People said, oh, He would have been like Mahatma Gandhi, or one of these, uh, you know, elevated teachers. And, but one biblically literate person said, no, if He came... He would be dot, 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 crucified. Still. 
people haven't changed. It troubled the very people who should have been excited about him coming. It troubled them. It troubled him. And listen, he said where, and he demanded of, Herod demanded of the scribes and the, the rulers. It says he gathered them together and he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. Can I just tell you this? I think this little inside scoop that we get on this Bible conference that Herod called is the reason that God turned the star off. That I believe that. I believe that. So we would get this. So this could be a part of the story. God allowed the star to kind of lose those guys for a little while. And they showed up at Jerusalem and said, where? And guess what they had to go to when the star got out of focus? They had to go to Scripture. This is important. Do you know that you're not always going to be able to read your circumstances? Can I tell you this? The stars might lie to you, but the Scriptures won't. The scriptures won't. And they went to what is written. They proceeded based on what the scriptures said. Now here's what bothers me. Do you notice how many of the scribes and priests went along with them? Apparently none. Isn't this odd? The group of people that should know refused to go. You know where the Messiah is going to be born? Yeah, and they said, well, we've seen his star, he's here. Oh, well, just get on down there and let us know how that goes. The scribes and the priests were unwilling to go just a very relatively few miles to see and experience what this group of men had sacrificed time. Listen, not just days, but likely weeks of travel, maybe months of travel to see this sight. And I believe that somewhere along the way, these wise men that were wise enough to realize that they were not looking for a palace. I believe they, they knew more than we may give, give them credit. Because I'll be real honest, if I was told, hey, you're going to go find a king, and then even, no matter how bright and specific this very odd spotlight star was, and no matter how it illuminated this little fella, in my mind I'd go, that doesn't look like any king I've ever seen. Baby boy. But listen, they were better prepared to receive Jesus than his own people. In John 1, the Bible says, Jesus, he came unto his own and his own received him not. He was in this world and the world was made by him and the world received him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. These, listen, these wise men from the east, they came, they saw Jesus. And listen to what it says. Well, first of all, verse 10, it says, when they saw the star, the star showed back up. And it says it came and stood over the place. That's why I know it couldn't have been a planetary alignment because literally it was like spotlight. Da -da! You know, like those movies where you hear the, 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 boom, the, I hear that all the time now. I've got tinnitus from shooting stuff. So like it's quiet and I'm hearing this ringing, you know. But I believe it was like that. I believe it was like, boom, illuminated. Listen, they were being guided with heavenly direction. They had followed Scripture. They were following the sign of the star. And then, the Bible says, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced. Do you know when they got heavenly direction, they rejoiced? They didn't gripe about it. They rejoiced. And do you know that that star, the reason I don't believe it was just something general, is because it says it came and stood over the place, over the place. There was like, that star was guiding them to one specific place. Isn't that narrow-minded of the star? We all just follow different stars, but we won't get to the same location if we do that, right? This star was very specific. Do you know what they did when they saw heavenly specific direction for their lives? They rejoiced. Do you know why a lot of us don't know God's will? Because we have a mentality. God, you submit your plan for my life to me and I'll, I'll review it. And then we don't know why we can't. Well, I don't even know if there is a God. I can't hear God's voice. Do you know that Paul got direction from God when Jesus blinded him after he said, Lord, what will you have me do? 
you submit to God and you submit to Christ first. You humble yourself. And yeah, God's not playing hide and go seek. If you seek God, He will be found of you. But listen, these same wise men that proceeded to Bethlehem, they left others in the dark because they refused to seek after the newborn king. But they were seeking Him and they found Him. That star illuminated Jesus and they rejoiced. They rejoiced. What's your rejoice face look like? Right? Do you know rejoicing is supposed to be a part of the Christian life? I have to tell my kids this. Because Lauren made them do a memory verse this last year. And they would say, and I'd say, what's your memory verse? Let, nothing, let everything be done without murmuring and complaining. <laughs> what? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I'm like... Well, can you give me a rejoice face? Lucas, can you give me a rejoice face? Yeah. Luke's pretty intense. Sometimes his rejoice face is a little bit forced. But do you know the Bible says when they saw the star, they rejoiced. Yes, this was a sacrifice. Yes, this was a risk. And yes, listen, this was some kind of journey. But it culminated when, when they found Christ, they rejoiced. And the Bible says, when they went in the house and they saw the child... And can I just point something out? Do you know Matthew the Evangelist? He did something different than some of our hymn writers do. Now, I know some of our hymn writers, like Silent Night, beautiful old song. I think it was still knocked. It was all the way back. I mean, I think it's older than our country. I'm not sure, but it's an old song. Silent Night. But it says in that song, round yon virgin, and it doesn't mean she was round means, you know, it's described in the scene. Round yon virgin, but it says mother and child. Do you know Matthew never did that? You may say never did what? He never put the order that way. I thought this was odd. Do you know what Matthew does over and over again? Just read chapter 2. The young child and Mary, his mother. They came into to the house where the young child was and Mary. And they fell down and worshipped them? No, the Bible says they worshipped him. And this is important because can I tell you something? If you put anything beside or with God, it's a form of idolatry. And they didn't do that. They worshipped Him. Jesus, do you know in Revelation when they fell down, when John fell down before a heavenly messenger, he said, see thou doest it not. Worship God. Do you know the greatest testimony of Jesus' deity is that He received and honored worship. When Thomas fell down at his feet and said, My Lord and my God, Jesus didn't say, Whoa, 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 whoa. No, he said, You're blessed, Thomas, because you've seen and you believe. Listen, the incarnation is when God, holy God, deity, became flesh. And therefore, it was completely appropriate for them to worship. But here's an interesting thing. Do you know what the Bible says they did? It says they fell down. And worship. I bring this up because it's been on my mind. I read a book that Brother Hardy wrote on worship. Do you know the word worship, if you do the etymology, it means to get down, to go down and worship. Brother Hardy used the illustration of, uh, of maybe an old movie where you saw a bunch of knights, you know, guys in armor. And it seems like just a bunch of knights all, you know, greeting each other. But then one knight takes his helmet off and when he does, all the other knights, they do this. Well, you don't know the plot line. You're just watching that. But what do you already know? When he took that helmet off, it was clear he was the king. He was different. These were wise men. If it's true that they were kings, these were wealthy men. They were guardians of a great treasure of gifts. And when they saw this child, they fell down and worshipped him. And can I tell you something? I know we're in America... Maybe it's because of our national heritage. I mean, we're revolutionaries. We don't bow the knee hardly to anything. Do you know this week I tried to make it a purpose to every day give time to the Lord and actually get on my knees? You know, you can pray driving down the road. Or if you let your wife drive, you'll pray a lot with her driving down the road. (laughs) Just kidding. If I'm in Tulsa and I'm getting tired, I let Lauren drive. Because after about five minutes of that, I'm wide awake. (laughs) Merge means gun it and jump on the brakes until there's a five-mile gap in the traffic. (laughs) 
I'm just kidding. I'm just playing. You, know, you can pray going down the road. Amen? You can pray. We're to be praying always. You know, you can pray when you're working. You can pray when you're washing dishes. You can pray when you're out hunting or fishing. You can talk to God. We do not have... Listen, we have a mediator. We can boldly come before the throne of God. But can I tell you something? As I, and I'm, this, is the, this is the end part of the message. They offered him gifts. Their gifts they gave him, I'm sure they were valuable, and they were gifts with some intention. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And this is not the message, but gold. It's a reference to Jesus' royalty. Frankincense, it's a reference to Jesus' priestly work, his priesthood. And myrrh, do you know that myrrh was referred to as death balm? A death balm. Why would you do that? Do you know what? Because they, I believe they understood this baby is born to die. He's born to die for me. And you know what? They saw Jesus and they worshipped Him. As far as I can tell, they went back to their own country. I don't know if they got to be around some 30-something years later when Jesus was crucified. But can I tell you something? I believe as they knelt before Him, something happened in them as they encountered Christ. I believe they were changed. They went back a different way than they came. I know that meant geographically they didn't go back to Herod. But can I tell you something? I do believe if you encounter Jesus, you'll go away different than you came. You're not going to be the same. Not if you really know Jesus. Something should change in you. Listen, the Bible says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. And as I close talking about these wise men, I wind up this message. The, the last point, we saw what they did. We know who they were. But here's the last question. What do we do about it? What, what's, this, what's to be made of this story? What's this story about for us? Let me quickly just make a few applications. You should be unashamed to seek God. You know what? We should be unhindered to worship God if we've encountered Christ. We ought to follow Scripture. There's a little practical application. Follow Scripture. Do you know that just because somebody says Jesus doesn't mean they're talking about the same Jesus you're talking about? Galatians chapter 1, Paul says, Beware, there's many people preaching a another gospel. If it's not another, it's perverted. And, but if any man preach any other gospel, if any man presents any other Jesus, let him be accursed. You know why he said that? Because people were going to come along that would do that. And listen, I don't care how sweet the Mormon Tabernacle Choir sounds, and they're amazing. I mean, what discipline and giftedness. But can I just say this? If they are preaching a different Christ, it's not going to work. There's one Jesus. And listen, the Bible says that, that, listen, you come to Christ, but then, can I ask you this? If you say, well, Brother Clay, I'm right doctrinally. Well, then do you worship Him? Do you lift him up? They worshipped him. Now they gave. They gave gifts. You may say, well, Jesus is the giver, and that's true. He's the gift. He's the giver. But you know, God does want something for Christmas. You ever have anybody that's hard to buy for? because You don't know what they want? And generally, if that's the case, it's probably not a dude, because flashlight bullets are guns. That's... I don't know who they are. Flashlights, knives... Ammo. Can't go wrong. Around here, anyways. Do you know what God wants? Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present. Here's a present. You present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. John chapter 4. Jesus spoke with a woman at the well. Some of you know the story. The Bible says in verse... 19, the woman saith unto him, unto Jesus, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit 
and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah comes, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speaketh unto thee am he. I am he. You know what, he, but did you catch what he said that God the Father seeks after? He seeks after those to worship him. Do you know, have you ever wondered why God made us where we could be ornery and sin and rebel against him? Because I don't believe you can truly receive worship and understand love unless there is the ability and a willingness. I really, I really believe this. The reason God allows us. Why did God, I mean, God put Adam and Eve knowing that they would sin, giving them the potential to break his own heart. God created us with the potential to break his heart, but he also created us with the ability to give him what he wants, which is worship. He wants us to worship him. Do you know, I believe it's perfectly fine to bow your head and thank God for his blessings before you eat. Can it become, can it become hollow, vain repetition? Sure, it can become that, but it doesn't have to be that. It can be a, a small act of worship. You get on your knees beside your bed at night and you say, well, I don't really need much. Well, forget asking for stuff. Just kneel down and worship Him. Yes. And take a knee and say, God, thank you. You've been a good God to me. Listen, I have a hard time being... I have, I have a hard time having a bad day. Not just because I married Lauren, but that's a big reason. I mean, a home run. I'm so grateful for my wife. But you know, when I see my kids... We were looking back at Christmas pictures. I remember getting ready for Christmas when Tori still had the NG tube in her nose. Do you all remember that? Yeah. She couldn't eat. I remember four, four and a half years. I remember four or five Christmases wishing we had a child and they told us we probably couldn't have a child. And then, man, Samuel, we gave him to the Lord and then five kids in six years. <laughs> bam, bam, bam. <laughs> man. God's good, amen? Yeah. Amen. I had no idea, amen? I mean, I love the kids, but I had no idea. You know what, you know what I want for Christmas? Just free babysitting, that's it. <laughs> that's it. You know, what I, you know what my friends and family told me? Good luck. <laughs> but you know what God wants? God wants those of us that have been saved by His grace and know Him to return. He, he doesn't need our money. He doesn't. Can I tell you something? God doesn't need anything, but He wants us. He seeks for those to worship Him in spirit and truth. Why, instead of driving down the road listening to your favorite old honky-tonk song or whatever it is you think you like, or even some of the shallow Christmas songs, do you know that some Christmas songs are actually worship songs? I like those. You know why? Because God likes those. You may say, well, God doesn't like the others. Well, I don't know. God may appreciate any kind of gifted music that He gives people, but I do know this. God expects us to use our gifts and talents to glorify Him. And you know, you can ride down the road and worship if you want to. You can. You can kneel down and have an encounter with the, the same God that these wise men worshipped. If you're here and you're not saved, can I close with this? Jesus loves you. He died on the cross. Salvation is a gift. It would break my heart. It would be the worst thing in the world for me to think that somebody spent a Christmas morning hearing the Word of God preach, yet they've never received this gift. Jesus Christ, salvation by faith. You can receive a free gift that's the forgiveness of sins, the pardon that only God provides. Some people don't value that because we've gotten into a culture where we don't really believe sin's that bad. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Do you have that this morning? If you're here and you're saved, then make some application today. Give God what He wants. Amen? Amen. Present to Him worship and service. Listen, He wants us to... Not be conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of our mind. He wants you to be unashamed of Him. I'm going to ask Miss Kristen to come to the piano. And I want to close. Let me say, well, Clay, you said you're closing three different times. Yeah, but based on Dad's standard, I was closing. Amen? <laughs> Dad's very scriptural. In Philippians, Paul said, finally, my brethren, that was exactly... 
in the middle of the letter to the Philippians. So dad's very scriptural because dad will say, finally, that means he's halfway done. I tell you, I praise God for a dad that preaches the word of God. Amen. Praise God for a family. But let's not just flippantly say that. Let's praise God for what he's done. Let's thank him and praise him. And if you're here this morning and you're not saved, here at Lindsay Chapel, we have an altar call. That's not to try to get you to do something that's not real. But my Bible says not to just be a hearer, but a doer of the word. And if God has prompted you, maybe you just didn't want to come at an altar and take a knee and say, God, I heard from you today and I'm going to do something about what you told me. Maybe you just need to take a knee in Thanksgiving, but if you're here and you need to do business with God, maybe you'd like to talk to somebody about being saved. This is an opportunity for you to do that. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, would you stand with me? Our heads bowed in reverence to the Word of God, Jesus Christ, our King. As Miss Kristen plays, the altars are open. Maybe you can do business with God where you sit, but sometimes it helps to take a knee at an altar. Listen, sometimes it helps to allow what God's doing in your heart to physically adjust what you're doing. Listen, those kings, they fell down. They bowed down and worshipped. I challenge you. Why don't you start this week? Maybe if it's just in your prayer closet. Begin a time where you spend time worshiping God. If you need to come, would you come? And if you need to talk to somebody, the pastor's right here. Would you come? Those wise men followed. Invitation still open. Let's sing that together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I'd like the youth choir, those of you that know the hymn of heaven, that's one we're learning to come forward. The rest of you can be seated just shortly, but um, I was asked before we close. I know, I said finally, and the sermon's over. But let's end with a hymn of praise to the Lord. And I don't don't believe Justin may not, he may not have any of the lyrics to this, but you'll get the hang of it. They've sang that, and if you know it, sing along with us. And we'll close the service out, hymn of heaven, and then Dad will dismiss us in prayer. There will be a day
a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And every prayer. house. Amen. Amen. Brother Brady, would you make your way here? We look forward to seeing you this evening. We'll be here at six o'clock. We'll be having the Lord's Supper tonight. Uh, And so you are certainly invited to come and be a part of that. Children, y'all do a great job. Praise God. You bless my heart. Brother, would you come and dismiss us in prayer? Dear Lord, I thank you for your son that you sent to be born of a virgin and uh, die and rise again for our sins. Lord, I just thank you for Uh, your word. I thank you for the promises, and Lord, I thank you for everything that you do for us, and Lord, I just pray as we go about this week that we would uh, not just share the Christmas story, but share your resurrection and and your power, and Lord, I just love you, and I thank you for our family, God, and I thank you for our church. In Jesus' name, amen.